All right, uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, uh, real quick, uh, Mr. Chadwick, can you get a sign-in sheet started? I, I didn't bring mine today. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, also, uh, I will admit I forgot. I, um, I thought that your handouts that I gave last time included the sheer design stuff, and I found out it doesn't. So I will give you all sheer design lecture notes on Monday. So sorry about that. But um, I think what you'll find is that it's, it's fairly straightforward. So real quick, let me, um, let me briefly uh, review what we did last time and, and where we're going. So what we were talking about last time was the concept of, of designing for shear. I think we have um, you know, hammered moment into the ground, and now it's time to look at the lovely shear diagram that we have to deal with as well. We looked at how do we design for shear. It's mostly by uh, uh, we account for some strength in the concrete, but um, we're also allowed, uh, or, or we also resist shear through the use of shear stirrups, which are basically just bent pieces of rebar that hook around the remaining reinforcement in your section. Tend to group them more around the supports and what have you, because lo and behold, that's where the highest shear is. Now, um, when you have a concrete beam that's loaded in shear, you go back to that. Uh, uh, more circle stuff that you all learned in mechanics of deformable bodies. And you see, well, if I have a stress element that's subjected to pure shear, and I draw a more circle for that, I'll find that its principal orientation is at 45 degrees, and that at that orientation, I have tension and compression equal and opposite acting in the direction shown. You go test a beam down in the lab, take a beam and load it in shear to failure, and what happens is something like this. It's funny how it opens, the crack, the crack opening direction is the same direction that you're seeing tension, that 45 degrees. And so, all right, how do we compute capacity? Well, it's pretty straightforward. We just sort of sum forces in the vertical direction and say, well, you get some resisting shear force from the uh, concrete, some resisting shear force from the steel reinforcement, and that's how we get Vn. The nominal capacity in shear is the nominal capacity in concrete plus the nominal capacity in shear. All right, phi is a whole lot simpler in shear design. It's 0.75, uh, uh, as you see. Now, uh, V sub C, your uh, compressive or your shear capacity for the concrete is 2 uh, lambda BWD squared FC prime. Remember squared FC prime. You put in PSI, you get out PSI, okay? For the steel, we take the area times the yield stress times the number of stirrups per beam depth. And the idea is we say, all right, we assume about a 45 degree crack and basically what we're trying to do is figure out about how many stirrups do we have present within a given crack, okay? So this one, you know, just for a conceptual standpoint would be about four stirrups in that crack. So you'd say, all right, let's take the uh, 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 capacity of a stirrup and if we want the shear capacity of the beam, multiply it by four, because in any given crack we're saying there's about four stirrups. Now, when we compute the area, we need to think, you know, cutting a cross section, ask how much steel is resisting that shear force. For a case like this, it would be two times the area of a single bar because we've got a U-shaped stirrup, so we've got two of them, or a hoop-shaped stirrup in this case. Um, if we're looking at the two cases on the left, that would be what we're dealing with, two uh, bar areas. For the one on the third one, that would be only one area, one uh, bar resisting shear. For the one on the right, that's how many? Four. Okay. Now, a couple notes on stirrups. We have to supply a minimum reinforcement as follows, but that never really becomes uh, an issue with shear. Um, also, there is a maximum limit on stirrup spacing, which we will use for design purposes. Also, there's a limit on uh, uh, the maximum amount of shear capacity that we're allowed to develop in the steel. We'll look at that today, but uh, again, it'll just be something we check, nothing we have to, uh, you know, change our designs for, what have you. All right. We did this example last time where we said, all right, here's a beam. Let's compute the shear capacity, and we got something that looked like this. All right. Was everybody all right with that? the idea that our shear diagram is linear in nature, okay? It's linear in nature. 
our shear resistance diagram is sort of this stepped diagram as you see here because we have changing regions of stirrup spacing. But everywhere we look, the shear resistance is larger than the shear loading, so we're good. Now, we could probably come up with a stirrup spacing that allowed this diagram to hug closer to the shear diagram better and would result in a more theoretically economic uh, section, but the problem is, is that then you would have stirrup spacings all over the place and it would just be impossible to build, okay? So, you mean you don't want to start specifying stirrup spacings 4.27386 inches and so on and so forth. Just keep it simple, all right? Make sense? All right. Now, again, I apologize. I, uh, I thought that I had uh, included these in the handout, but I guess I didn't, so I will provide these to you on Monday. Um, luckily, we're not, I'm not really um, deriving any massively different equations for you all. It's all pretty straightforward, and we'll go through our example in some pretty uh, straightforward detail here in a minute. Let's talk about designing for shear. When we design for shear, really what we're trying to do is figure out the spacing, okay? We can start off and assume we got a, let's say, a number three U-shaped stirrup, so we know the area in, in shear, we know, or the area of the steel reinforcement, we know the FY. When we're doing shear design, we're usually designing a beam that has already been sized for moments, so we know what the beam looks like, we know what D is, and we can calculate PVC pretty easily. The idea is just solve for S. So what is PVN? It's PVC plus PVS. How do you calculate PVC? Well, that's plug and chug. How do you calculate VS? AVFY D divided by S. Take this equation, rearrange, solve for S, bam. That's basically it in terms of an equation derivation standpoint. And that'll be pretty easy to follow here in a little bit. So a few notes, just so you all know what's coming up next. One of the things that ACI dictates is that you must include shear reinforcement anywhere that the shear force is greater than half of your concrete strength. See, when concrete fails in shear, it goes and it goes quick. So even if you've got adequate concrete capacity to withstand the loads, ACI says, no, 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 we're going to cut that off a little bit. Now, if you've got extremely low shear forces, you probably don't need to put any stirrups in. But if, you dealing, if you're dealing with a situation where, regardless of what's going on, um, your shear is greater than half of what your concrete can, support, or can supply, sorry, you're putting stirrups in there, even if it's just the maximum spacing of stirrups just to satisfy the requirement. Okay, that's number one. Number two, because of... Uh, bearing effects and other concentrated force effects and allowing that force to propagate throughout the beam for the purposes of design, you can actually start your shear design using the shear force obtained right here instead of right here at the support. The idea is to start your design, you can back off D away from the support and use the design there. Now, now there's a few cases that you can't do that. You can't do that if you've got a, ten, a, a load applied right to the tension flange, right near where the support is. You can't do that if you're looking at the design of what's called a corbel. Um, go to, a, let's say, the parking garage uh, a couple blocks down, and you look in there, and you'll see where the, the precast or the pre-top double T's are sitting on these corbels. You, you'll see them all over the place in the parking garage. You can't do uh, that end shear reduction there as well. But for most cases, yeah, you can just back off D away from the support. Um, like I said, there are regions where you technically don't need the stirrups from a strength uh, standpoint, but from a safety standpoint, you've got to supply them in order to just meet ACI requirements. So if we look at maximum stirrup spacings, we can actually, um, <coughs> excuse me, we can actually just, um, excuse me, uh, uh, look at those regions where we really don't need them and just use maximum stirrup spacings is either the minimum of D over 2 uh, or 24 inches. Now that's one spacing limit that we get. Another one comes from the minimum steel reinforcement requirement that if we're going to place steel reinforcement we have to have at least 
certain amount of, of, of steel grade. And the idea is, well, instead of actually looking at it from a steel reinforcement limit, why don't we just solve for the maximum spacing that we can provide and we get this. So you'll see how we progress through this throughout the example and you go, oh, okay, I, I get it. This isn't so bad. Okay, so here's how shear design works. The first thing that you do is you construct the shear diagram. And that's going to be a little bit more than just taking it and, and drawing it like that. We have to actually indicate some of the appropriate values on the plot. We need to figure out where uh, what I'll call VU star is, the shear at x equals d, d away from the support. We need to figure out the region where we've got to have stirrups for a strength standpoint. We've got to figure out where we have, need to put stirrups solely to meet code requirements. Then we've got to figure out where we don't need stirrups at all. Okay, so we'll see how we indicate that in a little bit. Okay, now for design purposes, we start out by calculating the required stirrup spacing d away from the support. And we lay out sort of a, I guess what I'll call a trial pattern. Then from that, we try and take that trial pattern of stirrups and back it off a little bit. One of the ways that we back it off is we look at the maximum stirrup spacing and see if we can eliminate some of that uh, from the design out in the regions of low shear. From that, um, we might be able to refine it a little bit more, maybe shave off a couple stirrups off the design. I think you'll find that shear design is a pretty, pretty nifty little process. Once it's all said and done, you just got to make sure your, uh, strength, in your or strength provided by your steel uh, doesn't violate the following limit. But that tends to never really happen. Does anybody have any questions? Again, we'll, we'll take this one slow because, again, I know, I, know I, uh, I forgot to give you all the handouts. All right. Everybody good? All right, so let me take some time and explain what's going on in this example. So we have a beam that's 16 inches wide and it's 25 inches deep, or effective depth of 25 inches. It's being subjected to a uniformly distributed load. To keep things simple, I just gave you the load. It includes the beam self-weight, and we'll say it's about 11 and a half kips per foot factored. So none of the load factors, anything like that, it's all there. The beam's 20 foot long, it's simply supported. 4 KSI normal weight concrete, 60 KSI steel, and I want to design a shear reinforcement for this section. Everybody okay with this? Okay. Uh, let's see. All right. So let's let's go through this shear design. We'll take we'll take our time with it. Let me move this out of the way. And move that out of the way. Okay. So just to keep things uh, simple, since you, uh, uh, since we're, <coughs> excuse me, you all don't have the slides. Let's write some things down. So I'll say beam properties. SC prime is 4 KSI, FY is 60. Now lambda, our lightweight aggregate factor, is 1 since we're dealing with normal weight concrete. Now um, let's see, B is 16 inches, D 25 inches. Um, let's see, we have a distributed load. Uh, 11.5 kips per foot. Length is 20 feet. Um, and then for this example, we're going to use number three. U-shaped stirrups. Anybody remember what that's going to make AV? Remember, the area of a number three is 0 0.11. 0 0.22, there we go. All 
All right. Everybody okay? All right. So step one, and this is going to be an involved step, but I'm going to construct the shear diagram. Okay. So keep in mind this is a simply supported beam. It's a simply supported beam with the uniformly distributed load. Now, we did this last time, right, and we got that V of X. Maybe I'll put VU of X is what? W U times L over 2 minus X. Right? Is that correct? Or maybe if I multiply that out, W U L over 2 minus W U X. Fair statement? Okay. So what I'm going to do is off to the side. I'm going to calculate WL over 2, which is 11.5 kips per foot, 20 foot over 2, which is what? 115. So, therefore, VU at some distance X is 115 kips minus 11.5 kips per foot times X. Is that a fair point? Now, if I was trying to, let's say, solve for X, I know this might seem a little silly right now, but just bear with me. Could I solve for x by saying the following? Could I say, how do I want to do this? We'll say x equals, what do we say, 115 kips minus vu. Times that. In other words, Basically what I did is add this over here and then subtract the VU. So I got 11.5 kips per foot times X equals 115 minus that, then divide by the 11.5. Is that all right? All right. Everybody okay with that? There's a reason why I did that. I want to have, a, I want to have the ability to plot what my shear diagram looks like. And then I want to know for a given value of shear, where does that occur on the beam? You'll, you'll see why we need that in the not too distant future. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll box these two equations because they are pretty valuable. One quick question. For these equations to work, what does X have to be in? Feet. So if I just plug and chug, I'm going to get an answer in feet. Right. Something worth mentioning. All right, uh, you want me to leave it up here for a sec? Y'all good? Okay. Now we're still not done with step one, but I'm going to, I mean I could plot the shear diagram right now, but I want to get a few key points on it. So let's look at concrete capacity.
How do I calculate the capacity of the concrete? You should be able to do that now. Shouldn't need the notes for today for that. There we go. Right? So that's two times what's lambda? One, it's normal weight concrete. What's the width of the beam? Twenty-five inches times the square root of what? 4,000, there we go. Square root, you put in PSI, you get out PSI. So, if I plug and chug, what numbers do I get? Make me all do some work, goodness. There we go. So, five zero five nine six pounds because it's psi times inches squared. Right. Okay. Now, phi v c. What's phi? There we go. For shear, it's 0.75. Oh, what am I doing? Okay, and then that is, what, 37? Oh, what happened there? Hey, fine, I won't, I won't put the sheet of paper up there. 37. Okay. Now, one thing else I'm going to compute right here, because remember, ACI says you don't need stirrups anywhere that the shear is less than one-half VVC. I'm going to calculate one half of that. And get and get that. All right, everybody okay? Now, the final thing I'm going to do is I'm going to compute what I'll call important values for plot. Okay. What's our equation for shear? What is it? It's like 115 minus or minus 11.5 times x, right? We got that, right? So the first thing I'm going to compute is this. I'm going to compute VU star. Now you might go, what in the heck is VU star? Maybe if I can draw a little star over there. VU star is the shear at x equals d. So what's my equation? 115 minus 11.5 times x. I'm going to say it's 115 kips minus 11.5 kips per foot times x of what is d? 25 inches. Got a problem with that? All right, plug and chug and you get get that. 
Everybody okay so far? Okay. Now, I also want to compute where on the beam does phi v c occur and where on the beam does a half phi v c occur. That's good enough. Okay, so how do I compute x? It's 115 minus the shear in question divided by 11.5, right? So 115 minus what is phi vc? 37, there we go. All right, and what do we get? The shear in question. My shear is that. That, no, that's a good point. What I'm trying to figure out is where on the shear diagram does this value occur? That's a good point. 6.7, and there you go. That's what I was asking. If you take these numbers and plug, bless you, if you take these numbers and plug them into the calculator, you're going to get 6.7, but the units are feet. So I'm going to multiply that by 12 and say 80.4 inches. The last one is going to be the same thing, only it's different fee or shear value. All right, and then that gives you what is it, eight point thirty five? which is 100.2 inches. All right. Does anybody have any questions so far? I want to take my time with what comes next so that you all understand what I'm doing and, and, and why I'm doing it. Am I, go ahead, am I good to move on to another screen? All right, let me go ahead and tell you while I'm drawing this up. This is going to take me a little while to draw, especially with the, the screen. I want it to be neat, so if I scratch a couple things out and you need to erase, that's fine. Let me draw it out, then I'll say, okay, go ahead and copy it down. So, um, I can switch? All right, so let me explain what I'm doing. Uh, example 12. Okay, so... Let's go back to a couple things. This is a, a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load, right? So the shear diagram looks something like that, right? Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm only going to focus on one half of it. That's number one. And then what I'm really going to plot is this. I'm going to take that shear diagram and I'm going to cut it off a little bit. Why am I cutting it off a little bit? Because I'm allowed to use that VU star, that shear at X equals D. Everybody okay with that? All right, so let me see how, let's see what I can do with this. Okay, so, oh goodness. Oh, nope, that's not what I wanted. There's like a tool in here I know that you can actually like draw a straight line. Oh. All right, so let's do, let's do this. Let's do that. And let's do that. There we go. Now it's starting to look a little bit like a plot. All right. Now, 
what my plot is really going to look like. I draw this blue. Whoop. Look something like that, and then it's going to go something like that. So this is like my shear diagram, and then I've cut it off at the top. So really, if I was trying to continue this out, it would go something about like that. Make sense? Okay. Now let me indicate a few values. Let's see. Red. I'm going to indicate this value right here. Actually, it's a little low. That value. And then that value. Okay. And then I think that's actually enough for me to actually start doing some work. Okay. So what I've got here is my shear diagram, and I've got it cut off right here. So what we're going to say is that this x-axis is literally x in inches, and then this y-axis is my shear in kips. Okay. Now, this cut off value right here, that's my shear diagram cut off at D, so that's VU star, and that's, what is it, uh, a 91.04 kips, okay? These two red dash lines, what they're going to be is, this is VVC, which was 37.95. And this is a half of VVC, which is uh, 18.97. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah, yeah, you can start drawing now. Sorry. What I'll go ahead and do is, while you all are drawing, since that's going to bug me if I don't fix that, just let me make that a little neater. Okay. Let me know when you all have got this and then I'll, I'll keep filling it in. I think this is kind of important to make sure that you understand how these diagrams are being constructed. Okay. All right, while we're filling this in, let, let's pop quiz something. So this is the, the y-axis. So this would be a shear of 0. This would be a shear of 18.97, a shear of 37.95, et cetera, right? This is my x-axis. So this is x equals 0, whatever. What is this point? What's the x value right here? 120, OK? It's because that's the mid-span of the beam, right? At mid-span, it's 0. What's the x value right here? There we go. Okay, so if I draw an x value right there, or one right there, let's indicate that out. 
this is 120 inches, this is 100.2, and this is, what is it, 80.4? Does that make sense? You got a puzzled look on your face. I wonder if I should take that as a compliment or not. All right, everybody good? All right, so let's start putting some, some dimensions as to what's going on. So let's see, how do I want to do this? Since I've got the option, let's use another color. Okay, so if I look at, let's say, this, this uh, shear diagram, remember, oh goodness, what happened there? Whoa. Okay, if I look at this shear diagram, I really have three regions of interest. I've got region one, region two, I'll have to delete that one here in a second, and region three. No, they're just dimensions. They're just dimensions. Okay. All right. Uh, where the... Okay, now, let's go back to, uh, if, if you don't mind, let me go back to something real quick. If you recall in our procedure, we need to define three regions of our shear diagram, where the stirrups are required, where the concrete carries shear, and where no stirrups are required at all. So if I go to my shear diagram, what's going on in this region here on the right? Do I need any stirrups there? No, because the shear is less than this. So I'll put here no stirrups required. Here I'll put concrete carries shear. And here, stirrups, oh, got ahead of myself. Stirrups needed. So my grand point for drawing this shear diagram out is that we have to have stirrups in this beam when it's all said and done from x equals zero to x equals 100.2 inches. And for the last 20 inches of our span, we probably will we'll be able to get by with just using the maximum spacing because we don't need, uh, we really don't need stirrups from a capacity standpoint. We just have to place the maximum uh, in order to satisfy requirements. So what I'll do is say uh, stirrup layout from x equals 0 to x equals 100.2. What do you think? Was that too complicated? Was that straightforward? Any questions? 
Okay, that's what I was saying before. We are allowed to start our design at the shear at x equals d. That's where we're going to start our design, is based off of this shear value, not this one. That, yeah. I mean, if you want to draw it out, you can, but we're not going to use. Okay, l let me ask you this, okay? What is the shear at the very top? It's 115. We're not going to use that value for design. We're going to use 91.04. Everybody good? Okay. So, all right. If it's all right, what I'm going to do is let's let's try some, we'll move this down a little bit. And then now we're gonna we're gonna actually do some design. Okay. Okay. So let's start out by coming up with a starting S value. Okay. So this is one of those formulas that uh, was in the uh, slideshow that I didn't print out, but I'll explain where it comes from. So S required is phi times AV FYT D over VU star minus phi VC. In other words, I'm figuring out how much my stirrup spacing needs to be right there at the support, right there at the very beginning. Okay? So, let's plug and chug. What do we get? Uh, I had it. What's that? No, no, no. It's, it's F sub Y T. Here, I'll, I'll clear that up. All right, so what's phi? There we go, all right. AV? FYT? That's just the yield stress? It's grade 60 rebar, so. All right. 25 inches, and then we're trying to figure out the required stirrup spacing at the beginning. So 91.04 minus, oh wait, I put inches. Minus VVC is what, 37.95? So that equals what? About 4.66 inches. Everybody, everybody got that? What? That that is. Oh, not not there. Huh? Okay. So right there at the beginning, I theoretically need a stirrup spacing of 4.66 inches. Are you going to tell a, a, a contractor or fabricator to lay out 4.66 inches of stirrup spacing? No. What are you going to tell them? No, no. You don't want the stirrups to be laid out farther apart than you need. You want them close together. You could say four and a half. Why don't we keep it simple for, our, uh, for the purposes of what we're doing in here and say four. What we're doing, you'll see why. I want everybody to be on the same page with what comes next. Round up to ten. Oh, good. Eighty-six point four, just round up. Okay. All right. All right. Now, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to, okay, we're going to use this, but we're going to come up with design number one. Okay, now, let me show you what a shear design looks like. Okay, so our first um, stirrup spacing that we got was S equals four inches. Okay, now, how far do we have to have stirrups across the entire beam? From x equals 0 to x equals 100.2. Okay, so this is typically what you do. You start your first stirrup out around 2 inches or about half of this. So from the very beginning of the beam, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, we're going to have one stirrup at 2 inches. Okay, and so that's going to equal 2 inches. Okay, then I'm going to space my remaining stirrups at four inches. So let me ask you a question. If I have to get to 100.2 inches at least, okay, how many stirrups do I need to space at four inches? 25, right? Okay. So if I do 25, at four inches, 25 spaces at four inches, that is 100 inches, and that gives me 26 stirrups. Uh, I'm, I put, I need to put equals. Equals 102 inches. I, it, it's typical. Okay, so it's typical to start your very, very first stirrup half away. So, so let me let me draw it out. Let me draw it out. So, well, hold hold on. Give me a moment. And that's not a joke because we're talking about shear, not moment. Yeah, that, that might be a pretty wide one. You might back it off at three or, or whatever. That's a rule of thumb. Yes, yes, rule of thumb. Okay, so here, here's my support, okay? So what I'm saying is I place my very first stirrup, let's say right here, where this distance is two inches. And then I keep placing, okay, there's four inches. There's another four inches. There's another four inches. And I keep going until I get to where? That point where I, I dictated I don't need stirrups, which is 100.2. So how many of those do I need? 25. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Did I answer your question? All right. So this, this is, that's four inches, and so on and so forth. Yes? Because... because you must place stirrups in that region. We're going to come back and refine this, okay? You get, I promise, I promise. We're going to come back and refine this, Lee. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. What's that? You, you, it's typical in construction practice to start that first one about half off. That's just, that's just typical from, from construction purposes. Now, I, ha I have a question for you all before we leave. How many stirrups are in the beam? You double that. Say it again? Double that. double that, because this is only to the half span. So for this design, that would be 52 stirrups in the beam. Okay? Now, what, I, what we're going to do next time is we're going to take this design of 26 stirrups, and we're ultimately going to be able to cut it down to 18 stirrups, because we're going to use different increments of spacing. Okay? We'll get there, okay, as we, as we move forward this. All right. Does everybody understand how I came up with this? If you understand how I came up with this, then you'll understand what comes next. Everybody good? All right. That's all I got. Uh, if you haven't turned in your homework, please do so. I will see you all on Monday. Y'all have a great weekend.